Hello, a big thank you for those who are joining us today. And thank you for this opportunity to talk to you about technology. Is it today's innovation or tomorrow's disruption? So let's begin. In 2005, we were introduced to the concept that the world is flat. The concept is they view the world as a level playing field in terms of commerce where all global players and competitors have the chance to compete on an equal ground. This forces us to think that for organizations to be competitive in global space, sometimes their historical or geographic advantage plays a role, but not in this concept. What happens here is that with two major forces like geoeconomics and technology, organizations will have the chance to compete in a global marketplace. So today, 15 years after, if I were to be asked about whether the world is flat, I would still say yes. The world is flat, but it's also too fast, too deep, because technology is advancing us in many levels that sometimes we haven't even imagined. So let's look at really how the world is transforming. This image is probably not familiar to you. It looks like just a typical big warehouse. But now I can guarantee that you can relate to this. Yes, this is Lazada, one of the fastest growing e-commerce website in Asia Pacific. So when we take a look at this mega platform, it definitely is mega for a lot of sense. One is the entire Lazada platform has about 155,000 sellers and you can choose amongst 3,000 brands. And today it's actually serving almost 560 million customers in this region. So what makes them big is because they have the ability to really use innovation. Let's look at three things that drives Lazada today. One is that they have a global and a robust digital marketing platform. They are also using a lot of highly automated data analytics and sentiment analysis. And of course, they have a very robust supply chain. So this is digital innovation where any merchants around the world can have the capability to sell their products halfway across the world. And this is what we're talking about when the world flattens. So the question is, when we look at all of this magnificent innovation, are we really getting the results that we want? Is innovation actually driving good outcomes for the society? For instance, an effective and an efficient public utility system or a fast, meaningful, and super um, rapid technological communications platform? Or is it actually giving us more flaws when we adopt and when we execute all of this innovation? Or worse, it actually widens the gap when it comes to the skills who should be protecting us from this big change. So this is the challenge that we face today. But before I go there, this is a perfect image when someone asked me to describe technology. This image actually depicts that, where you cannot even sense where the wire starts and where it actually ends. And given these wires and cables are so colorful, it is actually where our technology is today. It is so diverse and so colorful, but it is also very complex. And that's what we need to punctuate. Despite the colorful diversity of what technology brings, we need to understand that it is also complex when it's not integrated properly. So when we take a look at it, as we canvass a lot of organizations that are doing digital transformation today, I'd like to focus on these three surveys as they are asked, how are they experiencing or what exactly they're experiencing in their digital journey? So some of the C-levels actually responded with almost common trends. They're also varying degrees um, of challenges that they also face. But let us all focus on one area, and that is security risk. 
it is dominant in all of the surveys that security risk is one big challenge or barrier that they do have today as they are transforming. Which leads us to the question. The fact is, this technology causes more problems than the issues it attempts to resolve. So in the next few minutes, please join me. Let's explore how all of these innovations are actually impacting our digital life. This is our future landscape. What we have to recognize is that for organizations to remain competitive and relevant in this marketplace, they must embrace innovation together with the many opportunities that comes along it. So when you take a look at who and who is not transforming, no one. Every organization and every industry today are both forced and are joining the bandwagon. Even the most traditional industry like agriculture, down to the most complex industry like healthcare, are all moving to this fast pace change. The question also is the fact that are all the organization and industry ready? Let's face it. Alongside some of this innovation are the associated risks that we need to be cognizant. So let me walk you through to three areas or three industries where there is a lot of adoption of innovation, but equally, there are also eminent risks that we need to discuss. Let's start with the home. Before the pandemic, our home has been what I call running on a extreme IoT environment, meaning we run almost like any other organizations where we have embedded a lot of smart devices from smart TV, smart bulb, even smart speaker. They are all working together and functional, functioning in a, in a seamless interaction using what we call a CIE, which is the common environment where all of these um, devices are working. So this gives us really not just the luxury of time, but also gives us the efficiency that's all we need uh, at the moment. But here comes the challenge. We will now be sharing this home space with another complex environment. By 2021, about 20% of our global workforce will now move to remote work operations. This means that the work from home model will actually change how we conduct business. But it will also radically change what we call an expanded attack surface. So let's look at it closely on what are the eminent changes that we will see in this particular space. Remember, when we work from home, we always have the convenience of security platforms that gives us the luxury to make sure that our data transaction is safe. For instance, VPN. Virtual private network has been our access to safe uh, telecommuting. However, when you think about it, behind the many inventions and advancement in VPN, for example, they have done marvelous ways in managing data encryption, in making sure that they have the capability to scan the devices that gets into the VPN, and even managing latency. But that will eventually change or it's now changing because we are now seeing increased attack in VPN. This means that criminals are exploiting this system which are meant to protect us. They are using either known bots or discovering more vulnerabilities on both the appliance and in the environment. Let's look at some numbers. Same time last year, 60% of the attacks are more outbound. But today, almost 70% are more inbound attack. We can correlate this into two things. One is the increase of devices, IoT devices that we are now using, but also there is a rising autonomy between developers in putting up together applications or devices that are less secured. And this is driving that number. So 
when we look at our home space right now and in the future, this connectivity will definitely be robust, but it might welcome more attacks and it might open more gateway for what we call potential data contamination. Because when that corporate data is intermittently being mixed with personal data, that's the next big risk that we might face. Again, let's take a look at another industry the automotive industry. The automotive industry actually follows a lot of trends. In the global automotive trend survey that intends to look at the next generations, executives were asked on what likely is their next big revenue stream. Almost all of them have said that connectivity and digital application is the number two important area that they want to invest. This is good news for all of us, not just the people who love cars, but there are dangers or there are issues that we need to be concerned about. So let's describe them a little bit. What is what we call mitigating vulnerabilities? We have to recognize that this industry follows a highly tiered supply chain system. So when a vulnerability inside the vehicle is actually discovered, all other components have to actually fix it or release a fix all the way to what we call the original equipment manufacturer or OEM. All of these fixes have to be checked for interoperability. The challenge that we will be facing here is that apart from the fact that we need to do the patch, is also how much time does it have to take. Today, a simple patch requires a minimum of 20 hours. So that means that is the window of opportunity for people who, can, who wants to exploit this. So we become vulnerable while waiting for that patch. Another issue that we would likely going to face is what we, it's not really inherent to the devices that are inside the car. We users normally have after product and services that we incorporate inside the car. Say for instance, a Wi-Fi or a Bluetooth. Remember, most of them works on a dongle that actually is on a firmware or on a software. The challenge is once we integrate some of these devices, they are actually connected via a controller area network. This is a communication protocol. Imagine if the attackers can take control of the system and of the dongle that you integrated inside your car, they can inject messages or worse, issue commands not that safe. So that is where the challenge comes in. And lastly, is what we call ECQ. ECQ is the electronic command unit that is integrated into the car. So this is actually a very small device, but has a capability of um, safety nets or capability of functions ranging from something to control your essentials, your comfort or security areas in the car. And they all run on a very dedicated chip, a small one. So. Here comes the challenge. Once we're able to integrate again um, some of these devices, remember when ECQ was designed on design and implementation all the way to planning, security was not the top of their list. They were designed for the specific function that they supposedly do to the car. So, which means when you do data transfer, when you do send and receive messages, they can be intercepted because they are not encrypted. And that's where the challenge comes in. So, the challenge also for us is to ensure that smart cars don't just run fast, but they also should run safe. And the third element that I'd like to bring you is really on AI. AI is something that we are now enjoying. For instance, from Siri to self-driving cars to robots with almost human behavior characteristic, AI is undoubtedly progressing rapidly. That's a period. Now, the challenge we have today, or the opportunity rather, is that within the next three to five years, AI will expect more 
changes, good changes, and it will exponentially increase in the number of AI devices on the commercial level. The problem with AI is not that sci-fi context that AI will take over the world. No, the challenge is, is that how others are using AI that can be destructive. The point is, how can AI be dangerous? Let's step back a little bit. Remember, AI is programmed to do something beneficial. For instance, facial recognition program uses AI and it's used in many verticals and in many applications. A lot of it is, for instance, on your mobile phone. It is used right now as a secondary authentication program or as critical as allowing humanitarian groups to identify and secure and rescue victims using AI and then running their images into AI analytics. But when cyber criminal uses the same technology to develop something destructive against it, then AI will be dangerous. One of it is what we call deep fake. Deep fake is the use of forgeries of images audio visual they are put together in in a highly counterfeit material sometimes depicting an individual saying or doing something that they have never done that is deep fake so when deep fake is integrated into any workflow system it can manipulate influence or change the trajectory of your operation. And that's where AI becomes a challenge. Now, what are we facing or what we should watch out? As AI becomes so advanced, there's also advancement in how the other people are using it against its purpose. So we need to strengthen our ability to detect them and to integrate proper control so that we can thwart a lot of this wrong AI enabled applications that are working against us. So AI might look exciting. AI is definitely the next generation innovation, but we need to take a closer look on its adoption as we move forward. With innovation and disruption almost coming into what we call an arms race, some people ask me, Marla, is cybercrime revolutionizing or it's actually just evolving? And my answer is the latter. I believe that the cybercrime operation is just evolving because number one, they are still using traditional techniques that they have used in the past and recycling them. Second, they have been blending so well into our system that even industry like us in the security business are having a challenge really on detecting them. And third, we have not seen a big game changer that they have actually done. So I say that there's something that they're doing for sure, but they are really just um, revolving around what they have been doing so perfectly. So overall, we will see, still see that this crime, cybercrime industry will be very prevalent. Their attacks will even be closer to home. I was once asked if I could personify the cyber criminals or what we call the people behind the mask. And here's my answer. In times of war or conflict, there is a global principle outlined in the Geneva Convention called medical neutrality. This refers to the social contract that obligates us in the society to protect medical practitioners during times of war or conflict, meaning that they must be allowed to care for the sick and wounded. Everyone must receive the care that they need regardless of their political affiliations, and all parties must refrain from attacking them. It is recognizable that the cyber criminal world that we're dealing today have complete disregard on this principle. Today, as we are all brought down to our knees because of this global pandemic, we know that they are not just thriving, but they are hurting us badly. We see companies losing their jobs liquidating, closing. We see people not unsure of their future. 
And sadly, we even see lives that have been affected because of a digital attack. And these are the people that we are up against with. These are our real enemies. They will not cease to attack us. And when they attack, they will attack without mercy. You see, digital is not all about technology. The misconception about digital innovation or transformation is that the most important factor is technology. But we've already learned as you listen to me today that this is only one factor. The most important element of digital transformation is all about what we do for the customer, whether as we expand our business, customize our tools, offer them with better efficiency, that is all about digital transformation. So let's keep it in mind that technology must not only be acquired, but it has to be protected. So let me leave you with three big areas on what we could do. Number one, digital transformation is not just digital transformation. We have to make sure that it is equal to security transformation. We recognize the opportunities, but we have to be ready with the risk. Second, we need to map what I call our digital terrain. We must know our weak points and to be able to protect them with the utmost layer of protection. And third, this is what I always believe in. We need to foster what I call collective intelligence and resilience, meaning it is not just recognizing what the threats are, but being able to do something actionable so that we could stop them. Cyber attack is inevitable. Just like this powerful, devastating image in front of you, this is a wildfire in the US. And just like wildfire, cyber attack is something that is unwanted, unplanned, and uncontrolled. But after it can breathe life through a collective restorative power of the people, the nature, and technology, working together and allowing the vegetation to grow on charred areas. And this is the image of a restored area, better and stronger. There will be millions of people who will share our cyberspace today and in the future. The least we can do is work together that as we adopt new technologies, adopt new solutions, and even take risks, we must all not forget that security must also be in place. Our role in the society is to be able to design and develop a digital community that is safe and secured. <laughs>